Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma, and as I suggested, this is what I call my Morning Musings. I, I, have, I come here with you every Friday morning, 9.30 a.m. Central Time, uh, to share with you my understanding of the Word of God. And I want to recommend to you very highly that you tune in to Now TV on Saturday evenings and listen and view William, Dr. William Bell. William is one of the best friends I have in this world. He is a man that I consider to be one of the finest Bible students anywhere, period. Uh, and so, I, I mean, I've known William for 40 years now. And he, he always amazes me with his insights into Scripture. Uh, the depth, the breadth, the width of his learning and his understanding of the biblical narrative just, uh, I mean, it just blows me away constantly. So again, let me recommend that, uh, that you tune in to Now TV on Saturday evenings. Uh, I've forgotten the exact time, to be honest about it, of his program, somewhere around 7, 7.30, maybe, maybe a little bit later. But you will be glad that you tune in and listen to Dr. William Bell. Uh, he is just a fantastic teacher of the Word of God. Now, before I get into our discussion, our continuing discussion of the transfiguration of Jesus, and I'm going get to get to that in a moment, I, I just want to share with you, I, I'm so absolutely thrilled. I'm so excited about, about how covenant eschatology, I'll explain that term a little bit more momentarily, uh, the, the preterist movement, I'll explain that more in a moment, is growing so rapidly all over the world. You know, we're living in a time in which Bible knowledge, Bible study is, uh, is a rare thing. We are living in a time totally unlike the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century in which people had more time to study the Bible. I mean, after all, they didn't have their iPads, and they didn't have their laptops, and they didn't have the ability to travel as easily and extensively as we have in the 20th and the 21st century. And consequently, there was more there, were, there was a tremendous amount more of focus on the Bible and the study of the Bible. Consequently, what you had was, in the 16th century, you had the Reformation movement. As men turned to the Bible, and they read the Bible for the first time for themselves, because now, thanks to the work of some fantastic scholars whose courage cannot be ever, ever, depreciated. They translated the Bible into the common language of the people, and now men and women could read the Bible for themselves, they could understand the Bible for themselves, and it radically changed history. It innervated, energized the common man to know and to understand the Bible. Well, again, things have changed in the 20th and the 21st century. Look, I, I didn't even know how to turn a computer on until late 1989. And a, a deacon from the church that I was serving with said, well, Don, you know, just, just sit down and start typing and doing this and blah, blah, blah. I said, no, man, no, no. I'm liable to push the wrong button and blow up the world. <laughs> I mean, I, I was only about half joking. I was scared absolutely to death. And now... Seven days a week, sometimes I jokingly say 10 days a week, I, I'm working on the computer. It is an indispensable element of my ministry. I write books on my computer. I've written now over 31 books. I produce YouTube videos four or five mornings every single week. Well, you know, except holidays. At this particular time, I've produced 
over 1,500 YouTube videos. By the way, they're all there, free for the watching. Let me encourage you, go to YouTube and just type in Don K. Preston Morning Musings. It'll blow you away. You can search by subject. You can t search by theme. Over 1,600 videos. How do I do that? Well, because I've got a camera. I've got a laptop. I've got a computer. They didn't have that in the earlier days. And I, I'm on Facebook every single day. Look, when, when, my, when my kids very first approached me, I, I have two children, and my daughter approached me first and said, Dad, you got to get on Facebook. It will absolutely change your ministry. And I said, i got to get on what? You know, I'm, I'm a little bit of an old geezer. Uh, I turned 70 on December the 31st. And uh, thank you very much for saying I don't look like it. <laughs> but uh, I, number one, I don't feel 70 years old. But I'd never heard of Facebook. I'd never heard of YouTube. And my daughter says, you don't know what Facebook is? I said, uh, no. So she told me about it. And I was like, no, I have no interest in getting on Facebook. And she said, are you on YouTube? And I said, okay, what's that? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I don't have time for that. Then my son came to me, and he even signed me up on Facebook, set up an account for me. And I got, what would you do that for? I don't have any interest in it. I don't have time for it. Then, and I didn't, then my friend, William Bell, came to me and said, Don, you've got to get on YouTube. And I was going, man, no. <laughs> and he said, look, you've got to get on YouTube and you've got to get on Facebook. Now, William is extremely tech savvy, very, very sharp, keeps up with lots and lots of the new stuff. And I said, William, I wouldn't have the slightest idea how to produce a video for YouTube. I wouldn't have the slightest idea how to get on Facebook, although my daughter set up an account for me. He said, don't worry about it, Don. Go get yourself a little mini cam. I did. He marched me through it. And, it, you know, I, I hope you'll forgive me sharing some of this with you and taking up some time here. Uh, but, but, but my point of it is that we are living in such incredible times that in spite of the fact that people don't study as much as they used to, there's still a movement, a powerful movement that is starting to take place called the Preterist Movement. It is changing hearts. It is changing lives. And it will change the world. It may take longer than the Reformation Movement took because people back then, although they did not have the technology to spread the word as quickly, they did spread the word by word of mouth and they changed the world, just like the what's known as the Restoration Movement in America. They didn't have our technology, but they swept through America and spread to the world because people were studying. Well, listen, listen. Thanks to the technology that we have, like right now, I'm talking to you on Now TV, and more and more and more people are watching, they're listening, they're learning, they're reading. Listen, you can go to my website, donkpreston.com or eschatology.org or bibleprophecy.com, and you will find there literally thousands of articles literally thousands of articles on a vast array of eschatological subjects. They are all there free for you to read. And people around the world from virtually every country are availing themselves of the marvel of the modern technology. And again, a movement is underfoot. It is growing. It is spreading. Look, just over the last couple of weeks, I've gotten emails of encouragement and enthusiasm as lives are being changed. Norway, Sweden, South America, Nigeria, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Ethiopia, 
London, and on and on. I tell you what, folks, the preterist movement is growing. Now, let me explain. Let me define, all right? Pardon me. I, I've been sharing with you now for several months the challenge of Christ. The challenge of Christ is found in John 10, 37 following, in which Jesus said, Do not believe me for my word's sake. Believe me for my work's sake. If I do not do the works which my Father has given me, do not believe me. And the works which the Father gave Jesus to perform is the work of judgment and resurrection. And Jesus said, The Son of Man will come in the glory of the Father with His angels and shall reward every man according as his work shall be. And verily I say unto you, there are some standing here which shall not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Now the challenge, the challenge is that Jesus undeniably, explicitly, and emphatically said he was coming back within the lifetime of that first century audience. He was coming back in judgment and reward. The atheists, the skeptics, the Muslims, and the Jews. You know, just the other day I was reading an article on the website entitled JewsForJudaism.org, and that article said Jesus clearly predicted his return, and the end of the world. In the first century generation, he did not do it. Therefore, this is just one of many failed prophecies that Jesus made. Do you see the challenge? So I've been presenting to you what is known as the preterist view of Bible prophecy. Preterism, or preterist, is from a Latin word, pretero, and it means past. And it means, quite simply, that I espouse, I teach, I advocate, and I defend the view that all Bible prophecy, not some of it, but all Bible prophecy was fulfilled by the time of the end of the old covenant age of Israel that arrived with the dissolution and destruction of the temple, the priesthood, the sacrifices, etc., etc., in AD 70 at the hands of the Romans. And you're going, where in the world do you get that idea? Well, in Luke 21, 22, Jesus said, describing that event. By the way, Luke chapter 21, 20 to 24 is a, is a text that virtually everyone admits was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And Jesus said, these be the days of vengeance in which all things that are written must be fulfilled. He did not say some of it. He didn't say a little bit of it. He didn't even say most Bible prophecy or most of the things that have been written. He said, these be the days of vengeance in which all things that are written must be fulfilled. Do you catch the power of that? Well, this demands of us that we take His Word seriously. And what that may mean, it certainly did for me, what it may mean for you is that you be willing to change, yes, radically change your view of the nature of the day of the Lord. I mentioned another term called covenant eschatology. Now let me explain that. Regular quote, orthodox, <laughs> that word, boy, is full, oh my goodness. Anyway, uh, historical, the historical view of the church is that eschatology is about the end of human history, thus historical eschatology. History eschatology, the end of human history. Well, I once believed that. I stood up in public debate and affirmed that until I learned that it's wrong. But the view I'm presenting here on Now TV is what is known as covenant eschatology. And covenant eschatology means that when Jesus predicted the end of the age, He was predicting the end of the old covenant age, not the end of the messianic Christian age. You see, because the Bible teaches very clearly, and we'll be covering this more in later videos, the Bible teaches clearly, emphatically, and explicitly 
that the current Christian age has no end. You catch the power of that. Let me reiterate that. The Bible teaches that the current Christian age, Christ ruling and reigning from heaven on his throne with the Father, has no end. So let me ask you a question. How in the world can it be even closely right and correct to say we're waiting on the end of the current age when the Bible teaches that the current age has no end? How can that which has no end come to an end? Folks, it makes no sense whatsoever. It's one of those simple but profound facts that shattered my traditional, quote, orthodox, (laughs) unquote, views. I was just confronted with the simple reality. The Bible says the current Christian age has no end. I teach that the current Christian age will come to an end. Therefore, I am wrong. I'll never forget I was in public debate in Montgomery, Alabama with Professor David Hester of Faulkner University there just a few years ago. And in one of my affirmative speeches, I pressed this point. I said, folks, I want to give you one of the simplest points that can possibly be made. I want you to ponder it. I want you to think about it. I said, my friend David Hester here affirms that we are waiting on the end of the Christian age. And I presented a chart with scripture after scripture after scripture that affirms that the current Christian age has no end. And I turned to my friend and I said, Brother Hester, I want you to get up here and I want you to tell us how and why you teach that the current Christian age, the age of the church, the age of Christ and the new covenant will come to an end when the Bible says it has no end. I said, tell us very clearly, how can that which has no end come to an end? And I want to tell you what, folks, there was a literal, a visible shockwave that went through that audience. I saw people turning to their mate going, wow. I mean, they were stunned. It's such a clear, such a seemingly simple and yet profound reality. And so, when people say, we're looking for the second coming of Christ at the end of the current age, they are affirming something that is impossible biblically speaking. And that means this is one simple way that we can answer the challenge of Christ. It means that when Jesus said he was going to come in the glory of the Father with his angels and judge every man, he wasn't talking about a future event at the end of the Christian age. No. He was talking about an event to happen in the lifetime of the first century audience. Now, watch this. Now, all of this is directly related to our study of the transfiguration that, yes, we're going to get to here momentarily. All right? When Jesus predicted the fall of Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 24, verse 2, the disciples had just pointed out the the stones, the beauty and the size of the stones. And Jesus said, do you not see all of these things? The time is coming in which not one stone shall be left standing on top of another. And the disciples immediately answered, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming? Now watch this. And the end of the age. Now let me ask you a question. I hope you will ponder this. I hope you will ponder this in in light of the challenge of Christ. The challenge of Christ is, he said he was going to come. He was going to come in the lifetime of his first century disciples and apostles. Was he predicting his coming 
in the lifetime of his first century apostles at the end of the Christian age. Well, let me tell you something, folks. In Matthew 16, 27, 28, the Christian age has not even been established yet. How could he be predicting the end of the Christian age which had not yet been established? Furthermore, when the disciples, in direct response to Jesus' prediction of the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, the disciples linked that event, the destruction of the temple, with the end of the age. Jesus said, all of these things will be destroyed. The disciples said, tell us, when shall these things be? What's the sign of the end of the age? So let me ask you a question. What age did that Jerusalem temple that stood there in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, what age did that temple represent? Did it represent the Christian age? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, did it represent the new covenant? Uh, no. You see the problem here? That temple at Jerusalem represented one age. One covenant, one law, and that was the old covenant law of Moses. The disciples understood that, but they understood that the destruction of that temple, and by the way, they understood this from Old Testament prophecy, they understood that the destruction of that old covenant temple in the last days was to be the last days of that age. And it would give way to what they call the age to come. What in the Hebrew is the Hahalam Haba, the age of Messiah, the age of the new covenant. So do you see the power of this? The dissolution of the Jerusalem temple foretold in the Old Testament that would occur at the end of the age would give way to the age of Messiah and the new covenant and the age of Messiah and the new covenant the age in which you and I are now living, will never end. Listen, folks, when you and I can grasp this reality, this truth, we can answer the atheists, the Jews, the Muslims who say, oh, Jesus said he was going to come back and destroy the world in the first century. No, he said he was going to come back and put it into the old covenant world. He didn't say he was coming back to end human history. He said he was coming back to put an end to the old covenant history. This, this is the answer and the solution to the challenge of Christ. And this is proven. This is proven by the transfiguration. Now, I realize I've taken a lot of time to lead up to this, but this is so important. Everything that I've said so far conflates beautifully, perfectly, harmoniously with what the apostles saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. What happened on the Mount, the Mount of Transfiguration? Jesus was transfigured. His, his face shined like the sun. His clothes shined whiter than any soap could get it. <coughs> Pardon me. The disciples were scared out of their minds. They fell on their face onto the ground. Jesus touched them. Oh, and by the way, here's, here's a critical point. Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus talking to him. Moses and Elijah? Yeah. And Peter, when Jesus touched them and said, Do not be afraid, rise. Peter said, Lord, it's really good for us to be here. If it pleases you, let us build three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Now notice Peter said, one for you. You come first, Jesus. <laughs> At about that time, a voice from heaven, uh, in the Hebrew, it's both kol. A voice from heaven said, as Moses and Elijah disappeared, disappeared. This, Jesus alone was set, left standing there. 
And the voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Now, here's an interesting point from the Greek, all right? It's not just, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. In the Greek, it is, the, the hear him is in what is known as the emphatic mode. In other words, it's him, not Moses, not Elijah. In other words, Moses and Elijah, guess what? They just disappeared. Hear my son. And thus, as Hebrews chapter 1, 1 and 2 says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and by whom he created all things. Wow, do you catch that? The writer of Hebrews is echoing the transfiguration. Now, here's what this means. The transfiguration was a vision. It was real, but it was a vision of the glorification of Christ. Peter wanted to build three tabernacles. Let's put Jesus, Moses, and Elijah on, on an equal par because, after all, Moses is the lawgiver par excellence. And Elijah is the prophet par excellence. So here is Peter saying, Lord, let's give honor to all of you. I mean, you've appeared uh, in, a vi in this vision as an equal to them. But folks, they disappeared. They faded away. They left. Jesus alone was left standing, and the Father declared, Hear my Son. So, now catch this. Please catch the power of this. The transfiguration was a vision of the second coming of Christ, the parousia. It's what Jesus predicted in Matthew 16, 27. The transfiguration was not the actual fulfillment of Matthew 16, but it pointed to that event. We will develop this next week. I'll see you then.